Hello and welcome to this video. Um, this video is going to be called A History of Jazz in 20 Minutes, which is a stupid thing to try and, you know, do. It's a stupid thing to try and condense, you know, 100 years of worth of history in a 20 minutes, isn't it? But this is a response really, again, another response to uh, my most popular video now, which has just hit 55,000 views, which is a uh, the video where I asked the question, why modern jazz musicians all sound the same? Um, which has elicited a huge response um, for me <laughs> on my little channel, with a lot of people agreeing and a lot of people disagreeing. So I thought what I would do is just try and state fund fundamentally what my criticism is and what my position is. And the only way I can do it is with a very brief explanation about the history of jazz which I will start now. So if you're all comfortable, sit back, make yourself a cup of tea, and I'm gonna try and explain from my point of view with my knowledge, the way I see the history of jazz. So jazz emerges um, at the end of the 19th century. Uh, it's created by Afro-American musicians. Um, it's it created under extreme, um, an extreme situation of prejudice and racism. Uh, where um, the the creativity of Afro Americans has had to be channeled in basically into creating new forms of music to express themselves, and it's like a nuclear reactor. The two music forms that emerge, which are holding hands with each other, and they really are the same music, really, right at the beginning, is blues and jazz. Jazz is a form. Um, which innovates a number of really interesting things. One of them is the use of improvisation and soloing. Not extemporization like Bach or Mozart, I know they extemporize, but th this was actually creating, using improvisation to actually create the form, not having a written form and then extemporizing on it, which is what classical musicians did when they improvised in the old days. Um, so that's one of the innovations of it. Another innovation is the, the, the integration of an individual sound. The, the, um, rather than having the prescribed sound that you would have in classical music, you have your individual sound, and it, and it worked out how to integrate that into composition. And the, uh, the, probably the biggest and most important thing was the invention of groove, funkiness, swing, right? Not just keeping time, but having a stress and a sort of polyrhythmical bass, which comes from African music, I believe, um, which um, is funky, you know, that makes you want to tap your toes. Um, this music swimming around, we don't know much about it until it gets recorded, because you can't tell what it's like until you record it, because what recording does when it comes along is it enables jazz to become an art form, because now, these compositions that just are made up on the spot and just exist in the air now can be tied down. It's the first time this has ever happened. So the advent of recording coincides with the uh, beginnings of jazz. And in 1917, we see the first jazz recording by the original Dixie Land Jazz Band, which is a white group, which is uh, sort of assimilating in New Orleans these ideas from black musicians. A lot of the original black musicians like Freddie Keppard would not be recorded because they thought they, their sound would get stolen. So, um, in the 1920s, we see the emergence of jazz in terms of being able to listen to it and analyse it. Um, two musicians I'm going to name, Louis Armstrong, Jelly Roll Morton, um, also uh, Fletcher Henderson. There's a whole bunch of musicians that start to structure jazz. Louis Armstrong's a great genius that does this. Jelly Roll Morton does the same sort of thing. And so jazz starts to be structured and organized for recordings. Um, you get um, uh, the um, delineation of soloing, right? Because the, in the early jazz, we think that a lot of the time the soloists were all playing at the same time. It's like group improvisation. But uh, musicians like Lee Armstrong and Morton, they um, delineate um, zones so this like so you basically get soloing at this point you know where someone's comping in the background they're still improvising you know uh, um, and they're uh, they're um, and someone would be soloing this is all based upon the sort of New Orleans frontline um, structure of trombone clarinet and cornet where the cornet plays the melody the trombone plays the underpinning counterpoint and the um, clarinet um, weaves over the top. That is what you hear when you listen to 1920s Dixie, Dixieland New Orleans jazz. So there's the 1920s. Now if we go fast forward to the 1930s, what we see 
is an absolute change in jazz, a, 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 like a cataclysmic change. So the artist that I'm going to put forward for um, the 1930s is Count Basie. Now what we have in Count Basie is the invention of the rhythm section. It's a huge jump forward. It's a change. Now rather than it being that front line of the um, clarinet, cornet and uh, trombone, we now have piano, double bass, drums. We have time being kept by Joe Jones on the hi-hat. We have the walking bass line. The whole thing's changed. It's been orchestrated. Now, Cam Basie is actually, um, he's taking that from Fletcher Henderson. He was a very important artist in the 1920s. Um, but if we listen to Basie, we hear this modern groove, almost like rock and roll, rhythm and blues. We hear this different sound, the distance traveled in those 10 years, right? From say 1928 to 1938 is a huge distance. It's a massive jump forward, right? Um, if we now move to the 1940s, in 1940s we see the emergence of bebop. Um, bebop really comes out of the town where um, uh, Count Basie came from, Kansas City, where some of those swing musicians started playing um, you know, double time solos, you know, Charlie Parker heard that sound. He also um, had this um, innovation of how to play through chord changes using the colour tones, um, which are the upper, upper intervals of the chord, which means he could weave through complex chord changes and almost like um, transform the chord changes into new style of music. Uh, Charlie Parker's phrasing was different and so if we take the innovations of Charlie Parker along with a whole bunch of musicians that were already pioneering this new style which is bebop which would be like Thelonious Monk, Kenny Clark, Dizzy Gillespie, um, you know a whole host of these musicians but Charlie Parker is the guy like Louis Armstrong that provides the phrasing. So in the 1940s by the time we get to the 1940s we have bebop and bebop is this massive big jump from the Count Basie band in Duke Ellington in the 1930s. So can you get where I'm going from here? 1920s huge jump to 1930s. 1930s huge jump to the 1940s. Um, bebop sort of um, ties musicians up uh, creates a dead end for them really. Um, it's a little bit of a trap as much as um, it's, it's, it, 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 it's a way of freeing music but it's, um, how fast and boppy do you get? Um, so musicians in the 1950s start to create lots of different styles of music. In jazz we see jazz fracturing. If, if we take the rhythm and blues element that really moves into rock and roll. You mix that with country music and a little bit gospel and you get um, rock and roll in the in the late 50s, but we also get sort of the cool jazz, we get hard bop, and eventually, by the end of the 50s, we've got the free jazz of Ornette Coleman, uh, who emerges around about 58, 59. Now, if I was to now go from 10 years to Ornette Coleman at the end of the 50s, what we see is this huge change. Ornette Coleman starts to disregard the uh, tyranny of the chord progression and he starts to give weight to other aspects of the music to improvise from. He goes, I'm not going to necessarily follow those chord changes. If I feel the music wants to go in a certain direction, I'm going to let it go in a certain direction. If I feel that the rhythm is more important, I'm going to improvise more on the rhythm than I am on the harmonic chordal changes. Um, people like George Russell, who are like academics, we now have jazz, ac jazz academics who are exploring ideas of um, freedom using modality, so you're just working on a scale. Uh, Lenny Tristano, by the end of the late 40s, is actually um, experiment within, with a sort of free improvised jazz. So this idea of freedom emerges in the 1950s. Modality, um, free jazz. Coltrane is, is trying to take that 2-5-1 chord progression and just bust it open. So in other words, there's a massive jump from there to the 1950s. Now if we go to the 1960s we see the emergence of free jazz, avant-garde jazz um, and, and a lot of this jazz is, is mixed into the sort of civil rights movement that's going on. Freedom's become the currency of music and musicians are pushing at the envelope of what music is, you know, what we class as music and what are, and this, this goes back to Louis Armstrong, Louis Armstrong was using noises and sounds but for many jazz musicians in the 60s, that becomes the material they are using to make jazz. And this frees up the music, and this happens as rock music emerges. But as we can see, free jazz, you know, if you take an, an album like Free Jazz by Ornette Coleman, or Ascension by um, 
or interstellar space by Coltrane or Albert Ayler or Archie Shepp. If we take that music, we can see a massive jump forward uh, in the um, in the 1960s from the 1950s. Now let's move to the 1970s. Of course, in 1970s, jazz fusion emerges. Uh, now jazz fusion, and people have argued with me this, I, jazz fusion comes out of free jazz. If you listen to the early jazz rock albums uh, like Bitches Brew and some of like Extrapolation by John McGoughlin uh, or, or, Where, or Where Fortune Smiles. Um, if you listen to those early fusion albums, one of the things that's happened is that uh, jazz musicians have been able to integrate a new way of soloing, which takes, there's a, there's a link between say what Hendrix is doing, Sparse Bangled Banner and what, Albert Ayler's doing. There's a link between there and um, that tyranny of the chord changes is broken. And so if you listen to the early fusion albums, they're coming out of free jazz. If you listen to the Weather Reports album, it's it's a lot more freer, all right, than playing bebop. Um, but these albums sell. And so the commercial hands get their they, they get their hands on this and, and jazz musicians suddenly go back to the position they were in the 30s where they're making popular albums and in effect albums that you could dance to. But it's not all dance music. The Mavishn Orchestra, um, who were integrating rock music into jazz at that point, are having huge success, but they're actually leading the way in terms of rock music as well. Bands like Weather Report are leading the way, Herbie Hancock Headhunters. They're beyond what's actually happening in the rock music, pop music scene. They're beyond it. So if we take the jump between the 1960s to the 1970s, if we go from Ascension to Heavy Weather by Weather Report, that's a huge change, okay? When we get to the 1980s, um, jazz rock, jazz fusion is, has become very commercialized. Um, and we have the emergence of this sort of more conservative view of jazz, which um, comes out of the sort of winter masalis school where people go back to you know wearing suits and playing hard bop and this is the emergence in jazz of this revisionist view it emerged in the 1980s now um, in the 1980s there's some incredible music that sounds unlike the music in the 1970s i would uh, posit uh, bill laswell and the stuff he's doing uh, i would uh, prime time ornette coleman's band <laughs> ornette coleman what a heavyweight <laughs> You know, prime time's play, making fusion, but like unlike any fusion that existed in the 1970s, uh, and Steve Coleman M bass, those are new forms, and they and but what we're seeing with those new forms in jazz is now jazz is starting to take a little bit of a backseat, and it's it, it's uh, innovations are coming from outside, you know. So um, if you listen to say someone like Steve Coleman, he has taken ideas from 70s jazz rock. He's taken ideas from Ornette Coleman. Uh, he's mixed those with sort of the James Brown hip hop influence and put all those together. I mean, Steve Coleman's actually made rap albums as well. And it's that integration of hip hop. Now hip hop can be seen as one of the siblings <laughs> or um, sons or daughters of jazz, right? So jazz is fractured at this point. Um, but I would still say by the 80s, there is still music we can point out that sounds completely unlike 70s music and it's travelled. Now, once we get into the 1990s, I start to struggle to name a, a style of music that has the, the distance that we see from, say, a Love Supreme to Heavy Weather. You know, you've got to think when you listen to Weather Report that Joe Zawinul has come out of that music. You know, he was playing with Cannibal Adley, playing sort of post-hard bop, right? Um, and in that tenure, he, he ends up making an album like Heavy Weather. That is a big distance travel. Well, if you move from the 80s to the 90s, um, I don't see that, but there are still some really incredible emer musicians emerging. Bill Frizzell, Wayne Krantz, um, you know, that, that, um, and, I, and I think the stuff that Wayne Krantz is doing, I, I remember at the time in the 90s, the way he was uh, sort of, his approach to jazz seemed interesting and new. As I move to the 2000s and now the 2010s and now into 2020s, when I listened to modern jazz musicians, 
I hear incredible playing, I can hear interesting ideas, there's so much stuff going on that I like, I really love it, but I don't hear the distance travelled that I've just pointed out in my history of jazz, and, and I, I can name names. Now, the, the big change that has happened to all music is the advent of digital technologies, which we can see is around about 2000. And I, th I, my argument is, I think that's changed the way jazz works. Um, in, in some respects, it's been really positive. And I've made a video video about this, um, and I've made a video called uh, "How YouTube and the Internet Saved Jazz Rock." You know, and I've talked about you know Robert Glasper, uh, Thundercat, Louis Cole, Snarky Puppy, Dirty Loops. I love all those groups. They're all great. And the novelty of those is they're presenting jazz rock um, with an influence, say, with Louis Cole from EDM and Jungle and Drum and Bass. Um, with Snarky Puppy, there's a little bit of Neo Soul in there. But on the whole, if you take a band like Snarky Puppy, and I love them, they're great, don't get me wrong, I do love them. But what I'm hearing could easily have been made, except for the digital recording technology being used, but it could have been made in 1983 by the Brecker brothers, right? That's the, my point. So if you want to criticize uh, my position, what you need to do is you need to put forward an artist that doesn't sound like something from 30 years ago, right? Or sounds like jazz musicians playing over a hip hop groove, right? Drummers, you know, it, I love, I love Chris Daddy Dave, right? I love, that I love his playing, he's a huge influence on me, right? And, and those guys, for me, are the cutting edge of jazz, what they're doing. But it's not the jazz that's uh, interesting, it's the hip hop. They're, they're bringing that in from outside. You know, Jay Diller is, is probably been one of the most important influences on, on modern jazz, but these are coming from outside, right? And I think, um, those aspects of jazz that I started at the top of this video discussing, the use of improvisation, the, uh, the uh, development of an individual sound, so you're not copying Michael Brecker or Coltrane or Alan Holdsworth, you know, that you've, you've created your own sound, and, and the idea of groove. Now, I think the one thing that is happening in jazz is, is I think jazz musicians are renegotiating the idea of groove. That has changed over the last few years. I, I, I will admit that, um, in that jazz musicians have, have, have taken an influence from EDM, in Louis Cole's case, or uh, from uh, drum and bass, you know, um, they've taken an influence from hip hop, uh, program music, sampling. And I think that's going on, but that's going on across all music. Um, one of the things and I don't know the answer to this. The, the, big, the big question, and I'm sure it's going to hover over my YouTube now that um, I have attracted an audience from the jazz world as well as the progressive rock world. It's going to be weird having those two people, those two uh, audiences mixing together. Um, but uh, as I attract people from the jazz world, my overriding question is whether jazz is a living form, able to create new forms within itself, or whether it's a dead form, and there's nothing wrong with a dead form of music, right? The blues is dead. You know, you, you can't change the blues, you can't change Bach, you can't change Mozart. You can listen to Mozart and you can enjoy Mozart and you can go and see a concert and see someone playing it brilliant and you can hear their modern interpretation of Mozart, but it doesn't change, you know. Um, certain, I believe, certain genres emerge and they're new and they're alive and they are able to, with them themselves, develop. So the, 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 the history I've discussed, I think, is the history of when jazz was alive. And somewhere around about the 1970s, it started to stall, and it started to splutter in the 1980s, and it may well have just dropped down dead in the 1990s. Now, I'm not saying this is the case, so don't get all annoyed that I've said that. I'm not saying that. I'm just raising it as a discussion to whether that did actually happen. 
and now people are just going through the motions, making great jazz, and we could enjoy it and listen to it because we all love jazz. But is jazz as a style able to innovate within itself? That's the question. Anyway, that was my history of jazz in 20 minutes, and it's also a response to a lot of the comments and discussion that's been going on around my YouTube. Um, I'm here to have the discussion. I'm not here to come out and make great grand statements and, and, and have a position. I'm uh, being a little bit of a contrarian just to get the discussion going. So I hope you all appreciate that. And if you do appreciate that, please like this video. Please um, subscribe to the channel. I've just gone over 10,000 subscribers, which is incredible. Um, and if you want to support me, go deeper into this as well and, and get into a lot more weirder content then uh, become a Patreon, the link is there. Um, thanks for watching this video and I will see you on the next one.